Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, June 5th, and this is the weekly market update. Again, the disclaimer, anything that you see or hear on this video or podcast is not meant to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I cannot possibly know each and every person's financial status, risk tolerance, etc. Please do your own due diligence. Okay, in this week's reality check, uh, this was a tweet um, that I wanted to kind of go over. It's kind of interesting. And it is about Fed policy. So the question is, or the, the postulation is, pretend like you're Rip Van Winkle, right? Um, let's just go through the slide. For example, let's assume you fell asleep in February of 2020, woke up this month, which is May of 2021, and, and have now been appointed to head the Federal Reserve. You are given a piece of paper that shows the following data points. Number one, online job postings are up 24% since February 2020. Personal income per capita is up 28%, a, four, a positive four standard deviation move, the highest ever. Retail sales are up 20.4% on a two-year rate basis rate of change basis, the largest ever. Restaurant credit card data is up 13.1% on a two year uh, rolling average. Financial conditions are the easiest in history. Service sector PMI is at 70.1, the highest ever. Where would you set policy? And the point being is that um, with the conditions that we have, the Fed is, really too easy. And they are enabling all kinds of financial speculation bubbles. And they are contributing to the inflationary impulse that the economy is now um, seeing, where we're seeing all kinds of commodity prices, you know, having these extraordinary runs. I mean, it's been beneficial for our portfolio. But for the average person out there that's trying to survive, you know, they food prices are up. The UN just came out this week and said that, you know, food prices are the highest they've been in 10 years. We've been warning about this. We've been talking about this. This is going to, you know, run headlong into the situation that uh, we've been forecasting uh, over this decade that we think that, uh, or I think that we're going to have more issues with food production because of the weather, because of climate change. And it's not going to be the climate change that the current zeitgeist keeps promulgating. It's going to be colder, wetter, drier in different areas, and it's going to have shortened growing seasons. We already have a massive drought in the Western United States. Uh, one of the biggest droughts, I think the biggest drought since the drought watch, uh, people have been checking it for the last 20 years. So, but getting back to this, so you have all of these record statistics, and yet the Fed is maintaining its status, its stat. Uh, stated goal, which is to, they're not going to even talk about, talk about raising rates. So um, this is going to foster more bubblicious conditions. Uh, we're seeing in housing prices have now exceeded the 2008 bubble conditions. Um, I mean, just look around everywhere. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that um, this is a big deal that needs to be watched because eventually... <laughs> I mean, unless there's going to be, I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen in inflation and deflation. There's good, I, I, maybe I should just make a video talking about what I think about that and what my thinking is, but we have an inflationary impulse that's going on right now. I'll talk about another slide coming up about China pulling back on its uh, inflationary policies and the effect that could have, but whether this is going to be transitory or going to be inculcated into a, you know, the a new era of inflation. I mean, we have major seismic events that are on both sides of the inflation deflation uh, argument. So, but right now, when you look at these kind of statistics, I mean, the jobs numbers were not good on Friday. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with people just still not going back to work because they're getting benefits. I know that 25 states now, which are predominantly Republican states, have cut off the um, extended benefits, unemployment benefits. So 
we're going to see people going back to work. We're already seeing things move in the right direction, but you know, what are we seeing? Most of the jobs created are restaurant and bartender jobs. These are not high tech manufacturing, good paying long-term careers. So, um, just more of the BS economy. And uh, just wanted to point this out to you. This is, these are the statistics. These are, these are huge. These are great. But, um, you know, the, you should be, the Fed should be getting ahead of the curve and tightening conditions now, or tightening liquidity because this, uh, these are like all record statistics. And uh, this is going to lead to inflation. You know, we're seeing the inflation. It could lead to even more inflation. So I want to talk about some propaganda. Um, You know, one of the things I've always come to believe after many, many years of being alive, you know, I'm in my 50s now. And I wouldn't call myself a cynic, but I try to look at things for what they are. I believe that we live in a fallen world. I believe that people, um, I try to believe the best about people, but uh, my belief system uh, is one of that uh, we were all fallen and uh, we are all subject to temptation and uh, we are all um, sinners. So, you know, what I try to assume from people is that, you know, that goes for everybody. It's just not, you know, me saying I'm better than anybody else, or, you know, I'm probably the worst. But what I try to look at is, is, you know, people do things are motivated by money, greed, these type of things, power, okay? I always try to look at that, where does the money trail lead? When I see somebody standing up saying they want to help me or corporations doing this or whatever, what, what, who's benefiting? Qui bono, okay? Who is benefiting? Where, where is the money going? Who's getting the money? Okay. Nine times out of 10, if you follow the money, you, f- you figure out the situation. I'm just, I mean, yes, there are some people out there that, um, you know, put on sackcloth and ashes and they give all their money to the poor and they, you know, sacrifice themselves. But these are far and in between. People in government, people in corporations are in it to win it. And I follow the money trail. And, you know, that's what I kind of look at for this whole thing that we've been dealing with over the last year, you know, um, follow the money trail. And, uh, it was funny. I was watching a, um, thing about, uh, BLM and all these corporations had made all these pledges after George Floyd and after the riots that they were going to spend all these billions of dollars and hire all these people. And long story short, they did a, um, some research on it and, most of it never came to fruition. These corporations just jump on the bandwagon for a marketing ploy and to virtue signal and, you know, tell everybody, but nothing ever comes through, right? And it's the same thing here. You know, we have a situation where um, I'm talking here about trans fats were safer than butter. I remember eating margarine when I was younger. I remember being told that butter was bad. Don't put so much butter on your pancakes, clogs your arteries, don't eat so much meat. It's dangerous. And now what we're finding is, is the real obesity epidemic, the real health epidemic is nutritional, is lifestyle. You know, uh, I think I read a statistic that over 70% of the people that were hospitalized for the disease that cannot be mentioned were obese. So we have an obesity problem. We have a nutritional problem. We have a lifestyle problem here in the U.S. that's leading to a uh, healthcare crisis. We don't have a healthcare problem. We don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system. Um, I go to the grocery store and I watch people waddling around, um, obese, pushing around carts full of Little Debbie's, Doritos, and I don't know, orange colored water, sugar water, and these jugs. Um, I was always told that if you stay on the outside of the grocery store, fresh vegetable section, you know, the meat section, chicken, fresh stuff and cook it and eat it, you'll be uh, better off. If you eat a lot of processed foods, if you don't exercise, if you, you know, abuse your body and eat out all the time and eat fast food, you know, you're going to shorten your life. But we we don't have any discussion about that because it's very profitable. You know, it's funny the soft drink industry, they've tried to tax in some states 
Um, I'm not going to say I don't really care. I mean, if people want to tax, it's fine. I mean, people should have the choice to do what they want, but you could start there. I mean, how much, how much money, how much heartache, how much healthcare resources are spent on treating people that have made poor lifestyle choices? You know, we talk about COVID. You have 400,000 400, plus people dying of smoking-related diseases, smoking-related uh, diseases in the country every year. I don't know, nobody really, everybody just says, okay, well, uh, everybody acknowledges, why, are, why do people still smoke at this point with the data that's out there, okay? Why, why you know, do we tolerate 400,000 plus deaths a year and then we panic over um, this other deal because the media had it on constantly because it's sold. And, you know, this is a perfect example. You know, remember when trans fats were safer than real butter? Then they were banned years later for causing heart disease. Yeah, it causes inflammation, okay? The, the free radicals, when, you're, when it goes in your body, causes inflammation in your circulatory system. And the body tries to repair that. And it clogs, that's what clogs up your arteries. And then the cholesterol binds to that. So you're, when you eat these processed foods, you're damaging your body. But there's no discussion about it. They don't talk about it. You know, if you bring up the fact that, you know, they're actually out there promulgating, the media is, or some parts of the media, um, you know, that if you're fat, that's, that's good. That's beautiful. No, it's not. It's unhealthy, and you're going to statistically die earlier, and you're going to have more health problems. Why, so, and that's called fat shaming. Don't, don't say anything, John. That's fat shaming. Okay. Well, everybody has free choice, free will. But, you know, why, why was the nutritional pyramid where eating all the carbohydrates and grains, what, well, that was the food industry. They lobbied the government, and the government created these uh, standards. And now we find that, that, that those standards aren't good. I mean, I had issues with my weight for a while, and there was lifestyle choices. When I went to a keto-type diet, when I went to intermittent fasting, when I was serious about doing, my, doing exercising, um, I lost a lot of weight. I feel better. I'm healthier. You know, as you get older, you're, you know, I used to be a competitive power lifter. I used to box in the Navy. I was an athlete, uh, competed in track and field in the Navy, all kinds of things when I was younger, uh, played soccer, football, baseball, everything. So, um, you know, as you get older, you can't do those things. You know, I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, bench 500 pounds anymore. Okay, that's past me. What I'm trying to do now is have a, a, a healthy lifestyle so that not so I can live forever. I know eventually I'm going to die. That's the thing that we all have in common. We are going to die. So that when I get into my 60s, 70s, and possibly 80s, I don't have constant health problems. Okay, that are deleterious to my quality of life. But that's not even discussed. And this is just another example. It's follow the money. You know, these huge corporations that make all these processed foods, they lobby and, you know, they, you know, politicians respond and they pass laws and they influence the bureaucracies and you have revolving doors, right? You have people going between the FDA and the um, pharmaceutical companies. You have people going from the SEC to Wall Street and there should be laws against this. If you want to choose a, go a, a, a career in government and you want to be a bureaucrat that gets a lot of money and a lot of benefits for not doing much, you shouldn't be able to have a revolving door to be get regulatory captured by the industry that you're supposed to be regulating and then sail to, for, for, to, to a job there in that industry. I mean, it just doesn't make, you know, it doesn't make any sense. But this is what happens. So what am I bringing all this up? Well, you know, I talk about, there's been a lot of discussion about the vaccines for the disease that cannot be mentioned. This is an interesting thing. Uh, this is just a quick little synopsis that you could do hours of reading and research on this. And I don't ask you to take my word for this. I don't ask you to believe everything I say. You can go look this up for yourself. But here's your companies that are helping you with these vaccines. I'm not telling you not to take the vaccine. I'm not telling you to to take the vaccine. I'm telling you to be aware, be educated about what these companies, what this government is telling you. Let's look at Pfizer. You know, Pfizer is the one of the main jab makers. 
Well, look at some of their history. $4.7 billion in fines for false claims, drug and medical equipment safety violations, off-label promotion, corrupt practices, kickbacks, and bribery. Go look it up. There's complete sites talking about this. Moderna, the other one with the big uh, jab. They had never to this point before the disease that could not be mentioned jab, they had never brought a vaccine to market since its founding, despite fielding nine plus vaccine candidates, none of which made it through phase three clinical trials. And all of a sudden now, and if you, it's interesting, uh, they had an article, I think it was in uh, one of the financial papers I was reading, um, like the five top guys at that company are all, are all billionaires now. Follow the money. Johnson & Johnson, named in hundreds of thousands of lawsuits for toxic and or dangerous products, including drugs, shampoos, medical equipment, asbestos containment, baby powder. You remember the Tylenol thing? Um, you know, that really wasn't their fault. But, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of bad, bad, these are bad actors. They have proven themselves to be bad actors over time. And all of a sudden now they're heroes of the world. You're going to take a vaccine from them that, that is not approved. That's an experimental use authorization and they are shielded from any liability if it goes wrong. It's interesting. I'll try to find it and put it in the show notes, but there was a video um, you know, this is the first time we've had like respiratory viruses affect large groups of people in this country or around the world. And I'm not just talking about the Spanish flu. There was flus in the late sixties that was brought over from, um, Asia during the Vietnam war. It killed hundreds of thousands of people. Um, there was a flu, uh, respiratory virus in the early eighties and 60 minutes did they, they rushed out of virus. They rushed out a vaccine for that. Same like they did here. This is the first time this has happened, folks. I mean, people don't know their history. They don't do any research. They just go, whatever somebody in a government uh, official tells them, they just go along with. That seems, I mean, I'm, I'm a critical thinker. I don't do that. I want to know what's going on. Well, anyways, they rushed this vaccine out and a lot of people were affected. And again, there was no liability. There was a um, fund set up. There was a commission set up to adjudicate and compensate people that were damaged and hurt and they, they got nothing and they were permanently damaged. So, you know, are you going to get on an airplane that um, has been designed by uh, people that have never successfully designed an airplane and has not been tested or verified by any civil aviation authority? Would you do that? Would you put your children on that? But you're sticking these things into your body and you are the experiment. You are the phase three trial. So very well, this could all work out. It could be fine for most people it is, but um, we've had, you know, the, there's a reporting mechanism that the, that the CDC has for tracking people that have adverse reactions. So I think it's called the vaccine adverse reaction, whatever reporting system. And there's been thousands of reports of adverse reactions and deaths. Is the media picking this up? No, we have virologists that are, that are um, experts that are working at, you know, have worked on at, at, at prestigious institutions. They cannot, they're banned from Twitter and YouTube because they dare to challenge the status quo. I mean, one of the former researchers at Moderna was just banned from Twitter because he said that, yes, this thing does shed. The Moderna vaccine creates spike proteins and they shed from people that have been vaccinated but they don't know the full effect. He's banned off Twitter. So we can't even have these discussions. The status quo, this is Soviet type, you know, East German Stasi type control of the media. I mean, this video is probably gonna get flagged. I haven't had a video flagged in a while, maybe this will be it. So I'm not telling you what to do. What I'm telling you to do is be a critical thinker, think about things. And this spilt is like, why are you going on about this? Most people don't wanna hear about this. I don't come here to listen to your opinions on these things. Okay, fine. But this spills over to the financial markets. I just told you what's going on with the Federal Reserve. All of the metrics are screaming, tighten liquidity. You're creating bubbles. You're creating inflation. It's detrimental to the average person. They're not going to do it. So you have to protect yourself. You have to be aware. You have to spend time. You can't just plop down in front of the TV after your 40 two hours at work and sitting in traffic, commuting back and forth and watch Netflix all weekend. Wake up, do a little bit of research, take some responsibility for yourself financially, medically, 
every every way because i've said this before really when it comes down to it no one really cares about you maybe your mom does hopefully and that's not even certain anymore for most people so you know what you're on your own you better figure things out for yourself and it's hard to do because they're putting up all these roadblocks in all of these ways to try to stop you from you know just go along prol citizen get with the program citizen and all will be fine so do some research okay wanted to hit this up you know gun background checks hit another record you know is this a serious country is this a real country is this country getting better when we're having record background checks for guns why are why is everybody buying guns you know why are we having more rioting every time that a black felon gets shot in this country we have rioting just happened again in Minneapolis. We have an ongoing insurrection going on in Portland. It's not even reported. No one talks about it. Antifa, whatever. Is this a serious country? This doesn't happen in other countries around the world. Do you, do you understand that? In third world countries, it does. It are out of control. Um, this isn't happening in, in, uh, in most other countries where most of the cities are out of control and the population is at odds with each other. And we have these narratives that are created that are going to manifest uh, probably eventually in a civil war. Are you not seeing this? Because this is the kind of what when you watch what people do, not what they say. When people are worried and frightened and getting concerned, this is the kind of stuff they do. They prepare for the worst. Concerns about increased violence and crime continue to fuel a surge in gun purchases and background checks. The FBI set a record for May in background checks. The Bureau's latest data suggests 2021 will be another record year for background checks and sales topping the nearly 40 million checks last year, the Washington Examiner reported Wednesday. Inventory of firearms is low, and the availability of ammunition is scarce due to the demand for weapons. I've been reporting this for over a year. I still haven't got my uh, Mini 14 that I wanted to buy. I mean, the guy, I, was on, I was on the wait list. The guy never called me back. I don't even, I don't even know where I'm at. I have to go you know, try to find another supplier. Quote, today our clients are buying anything that is not nailed down. And if it is nailed down, some are bringing pry bars. We are selling whatever we can, get in stock, and pretty much as quickly as it comes in. It typically goes right back out. So if everything's so Shangri-La and everything's wonderful and we're progressing to this new utopia of ice cream cones, puppy dogs, and lollipops under this regime, what's, why is everybody buying guns? Ask yourself the question. I... I watch what people do, not what they say. People feel safe. Do they look at what they see with their eyes uh, uh, and hear with their ears and think that, you know, well, I don't really need a gun because everything's getting better now. We got rid of the orange man. We're going to have unity now and everybody's going to get along. And all of the things that uh, have been built up over the last, you know, uh, the hatred among different groups the mistrust that's been created, a multicultural society that's not getting along, evidently. Um, it's all wonderful. So I'm going to go out and buy a gun and ammunition because I'm just a recreational shooter. That's kind of, that's probably why we're having record gun sales, right? Mm -hmm. This is something that getting back to why most of you guys come here, let's talk about this. You know, I just talked to you about the U.S. Federal Reserve in the reality check. Let's talk about Chinese credit collapsing. This comes from Peter Sainsbury, uh, Materials Risk. I interviewed him, uh, I don't know, six months ago. Um, I think his, he does really great work. He brought this to my attention. I got this slide from another uh, person that I follow, but he's been talking about something similar. He wrote an article, I'll put a link to it. But so what we have here, what you're looking at is in dark blue is the CRB index uh, across the bottom. Those, it's 2010 to 2021. And what you're seeing, the light blue is the Chinese credit impulse um, advanced 16 months. So what you're looking at is, is that, um, you know, China is probably the, well, not probably is the biggest, is the biggest consumer of most raw materials in the world. So when they start creating credit printing, i.e. printing money, um, you know, we have, a we have a tendency to see commodity prices go up. And this seems to be very tightly correlated with a lag, a lead in a lag, 16 months, typically. 
And so what we're seeing here is they've been tightening liquidity. They've been trying to talk down commodity prices and they've been, um, you see prior instances where they have collapsed their credit um, creation has led to decreases in commodity prices with a 16 month lag. And it's pretty tightly correlated if you look back to 2010, to 2014, to 2016, 17. And now we have this huge differential where we have the CRB up massively uh, year over year. And uh, we're seeing an alligator jaw open here. We're seeing this opening where Chinese credit is collapsing. The credit impulse is collapsing. And uh, that would indicate to me, based on what we've seen in the past, that we are uh, could be very quickly in the next couple of months, see a deflationary episode. I don't know if it'll be temporary, but uh, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that this needs to be watched. Um, is this time going to be different and commodities are going to continue higher regardless of what's happening with the Chinese? I would suggest that it's never different this time. Will it be as bad? Maybe not because the rest of the world is having a huge credit impulse and credit creation. Will it be sufficient to over come the decline in the Chinese um, credit contraction? I don't think so. So yes, we're very heavily invested in commodities. I think just about every company, almost all the com companies in the um, AIA portfolio are commodity companies. We've had a tremendous run. Uh, we've got companies, uh, uranium stocks are up, you know, I've got some uranium stocks are up five, 600%. I have oil stocks that uh, you know have done very well, um, but we need to take this into consideration. We may push higher over the next month or so, but we need to watch the CRB and see if it starts to demonstrate that it's rolling over, and then we need to sell. I'm not a trader, but you know I don't think you want to sit around and and have a you know twenty, thirty, forty percent drawdown when you can just sit on the sidelines and wait for them to crank it up. I do believe that this will be a decade of higher commodity prices, but that's 10 years. You can have, you can and will have episodes of corrections and deflationary scares during that. I believe this is going to be a decade of inflation. Again, you can have deflationary scares, disinflationary scares in that interim. And I believe they can be tradable. And I think this is a tool that can be used, okay? And I think you're going to see that maybe later this summer starting to emerge that this impulse, um, you know, as the caption here says, Chinese liquidity is in crash mode as they have been purposely, purposeful, purposefully tightening their monetary policy construct. Com commodities based upon their six, commodities based upon their 16 month lag effect should begin to see deflationary forces in, to prices post August. So, you know, we're going to have to monitor this, but even now we're seeing, you know, are we, are, is the other countries going to begin tightening? You know, I follow the credit markets online. There's a central bank website and a lot of countries now are starting to tighten credit. So I'm not saying it's over for the decade long term, but I'm thinking that, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing to start taking profits. And most people are not going to want to hear that. I'm not saying sell everything tomorrow. I'm not saying that. But if you are up six, five, six hundred percent, Okay. And, and uranium may be an outlier. Okay. But what I'm trying to tell you is when things go down, everything goes down. Okay. Um, the danger is, is that we don't know for certain that this will happen. The data seems to indicate that when the Chinese, you know, crash their credit, the commodities crash also. So just pointing this out, I've talked about it before. I'll put the article up, but you need to be aware of this. And now everybody's on this trade now. Have you noticed that? I'm on Twitter now. I mean, it was like myself and John Quakes and Michael Alkin and a couple other people talking about uranium two or three years ago. Now there's like multiple people that have newsletters and that are uranium experts, all the people that are oil experts now. That's why you see me pull back. I'm, I'm watching this and I'm gauging it now. FinTwit is very insular and there, you know, that's maybe not a direct correlation, but uh, even you're starting to see people talk about commodities are the place to be. I don't want to be in a sector or investing in things that everybody else is investing in. So something to watch uh, this, you know, 
It's like driving down the street. You come to a street light, it's just turned yellow. Do you make the decision to step on the brake or do you accelerate and go to try to make it through the intersection? Um, this is national ga natural gas liquids pricing. Uh, I just wanted to point this out because this is why we've talked about Antero resources, which I believe made new highs this week. Um, this is one of the reasons why natural gas liquids pricing, their big NGL producer, I believe the first or second largest in the United States. And, you know, the export market is tremendous for these uh, products right now. And uh, that's, you know, been another one of our success stories. I didn't come up with the idea. Uh, got it from other people that I correspond with on Twitter that I um, talk to, Grain Jones, Contrarian8888, these kind of guys that were on, on this really, uh, before everybody else. And uh, it's really played out well. This is one of the public companies that we talked about. And uh, I mean, I think we're up, you know, almost 300% on this deal. So a um, couple things to note. I mean, that's why I was just talking to a younger investor, a guy that's just starting out. It's his first job. He's on our crew. And, you know, he doesn't have any debt. He's trying to get going. And I was like, look, you got to educate yourself on investing. You have to, you know, get on Twitter, read you know, cultivate a group of people that you can, you know, learn from that have shown that they've been successful, that they know what they're doing. And it takes tremendous amount of work. And this is, you know, it's like Charlie Munger said, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We try to take the ideas from the smartest people we can find because we can't come up with every idea ourselves. No one's that smart. And so it, uh, I've, I've, I've preached that from, for a long time. Um, I come up with some good ideas myself and other people come up with other ideas. And I'm not shy to take their ideas, vet them, and if they seem correct, um, put my money into them. So, you know, coal's getting a lot of play now. Um, I just wanted to point this uh, slide out from Twitter. Uh, operational coal plants on Earth, as you can see, um, there's a lot of coal plants, right? So since 2000, the, last line here, since 2000, the world has more than doubled its coal-fired power capacity. And that's going to continue. Yes, you're going to see less um, coal use for thermal electricity generation in the West, in the OECD countries, uh, Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, that kind of stuff, because everybody's going green. They went nuts. They're going nuts with this green stuff. But the rest of the world, I mean, I just read an article the other day. Um, uh, Tanzania had an article in one of their papers in uh, the main one of the main papers that they look at it was an editorial talking about using coal to you know further you know make the country prosperous electrify the country bring electricity it's the cheapest quickest way to do it that's what these other smaller emerging markets are going to do whether you like it or not and so there is an opportunity here because there's underinvestment you know We've seen, you know, like I talked about in last week's presentation, you're now going to see, I don't know how successful it will be, but there definitely have been emboldened now, the activists, the, um, with the lawsuits, with governments now going after these uh, hydrocarbon companies, that's going to tend to lead to less investment, but the demand will not go away. And so that is where your opportunity is. Again, a uh, long way to go for the energy bull market. Um, energy is a percent of the S&P 500 market capitalization. In 2020, that was a time to buy. You know, I talked about that earlier a couple minutes ago where I said that, you know, I was buying oil stocks when, you know, oil was last March when oil was negative 40 or whatever it was. And everybody said, this is the end of oil. And remember all that nonsense? That's all that, that all dissipated like, you know, um, a, a water puddle in the sun or a fart in the wind. And uh, it's not going away anytime soon. And so what you have here now is, you know, this was your, this was like a historical generation, bu generational buying opportunity where energy stocks represented 2% of the S&P market capitalization. Now they're three to 4%. So you're off the bottom. You're still a lot of, a lot of runway in front of us uh, over the next decade. I believe we are going to have an energy crisis based on the uh, fact that investment's been curtailed so much. But here's the, here's the average during the last commodity cycle. Energy stocks represented 12 to 16% of the S&P. We're at three. So this implies that we could see at least, you know, 
three times from this level. And of course, it, that's just in your bigger stocks, right? Those are your ones that are included in the S&P. There's a lot of small caps and mid caps are going to do even better than that. Okay, that will go up 10 times, 20 times. Uh, it's just a matter of finding them and digging them out. So wanted to point this out. We had a long way to go for this energy bull market. Wanted to point this slide out because I get a kick out of this. You know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Money talks, BS walks, always follow the money. And so we have a company, this chart, chart basically shows the returns since last September for um, these various companies. Here's BP. And this is just when they decided they didn't want to be an oil and gas company anymore. They wanted to go woke. They wanted to be an ESG. They wanted to sell off all their hydrocarbons and become a green energy company. And so you'll see that they were kind of all these are, this is BP, this is Exxon Mobil, obviously. This is Canadian Natural Resources, big um, oil sands operator up in the Canada and Synovus, which is another big oil sands company. So what you can see is they were tracking pretty much all together. And then they started diverging, right? as money probably flowed out of BP and into these other companies. Now, even Exxon has lagged quite a bit now, and it's, you know, not going to be performing because it's being attacked by activists. But look at Synovus and CNQ. I mean, CNQ's uh, almost doubled. This is a very large company, too. This isn't some junior company. This is a very large company. It's up almost 100% and Synovus is up, and they're starting to pull away. The divergence is obvious. Money flows to where it's going to be treated best. And if you're going to be an oil and gas company and there's going to be higher oil and gas prices and you're divesting yourself of these resources to go green, the stock, people are going to sell the stock. Are ESG companies going or funds going to buy BP? Probably not. Are oil and gas investors going to buy BP? No. Why would you? And the proof's in the pudding. You know, they don't want to be an oil and gas company anymore. They don't know what they want to be. And guess what happens to the stock price? It lags. And, you know, got four times the, you know, three times the outperformance from CNQ, which is pure play and doesn't get involved in politics. Yes, there are risks in Canada, carbon taxes, but these companies are not going to pay the carbon taxes. You understand that, right? The consumer will pay the carbon taxes. That's how this works. Corporations don't pay tax. Yes, they pay it. They write the check. You pay it. All costs get passed on to the, to the consumer for the most part. That's just a general statement. I know it's not exact. I've got a tax for Senate before, but costs get passed on to you. Regulatory costs, taxes, these type of things. And so prices get raised over time to compensate, to get the profit margins back up. So if they want to put $150 a ton carbon tax on whatever, you're going to pay because you're not going to stop driving your F-250 or whatever back and forth to work in any time of reasonable time frame. So long story short, uh, the proof's in the pudding, and this is a great visual. We'll see if this continues. Maybe this will reverse. Maybe these will turn down because oil's going away, if that's what you believe, and BP will rocket higher. They, you know, this isn't, the t I said this before in another video, this isn't the first time BP tried to go green. They've did this before. When they first came out with their marketing, this is like 20 years ago. I actually worked at the Amoco refinery at Texas City. They got bought by BP, and that's when they went, now, we didn't work for them. We worked for a utility that ran their utilities for them, ran their power plants in the refinery for them, supplied steam to their processes. And we saw their whole beyond petroleum transformation. They were building all these solar farms and wind farms. And that all got divested like 10 years later or got shut down or scaled tremendously back. It didn't work. The returns weren't there. So they're going to try to do it again because everybody has short memories. So... I mean, I haven't gone back and looked at what the stock price did during that time, but that was during the time when the refinery, Texas City refinery blew up and they had the Macondo disaster. So they were having a whole bunch of other issues besides, you know, trying to be, go beyond petroleum. This is an excellent article. This was, um, I'll put a link to this. Move to net zero, quote, inevitably means more mining, unquote. Well, haven't we been saying that forever? And now it's being acknowledged by a lot of the climate change uh, mitigation with renewables and every other thing, hydrogen, all these other schemes they come up with. Oh, by the way, they just realized if you don't mine it or grow it, you don't have it. 
The public will need to accept greater mining activity if the world is to meet the challenge of going green. Interesting, really? Resource experts say the current supply of various metals and minerals cannot support a global economy producing net zero carbon emissions. Really? Who didn't know that? Most people. The public are not in this space at the moment. I don't think they understand yet the full implications of the green revolution. The head of earth sciences at London's natural history museum told BBC news. I'll put a link to the article. I think this was from, this was from one of the UK newspapers. I don't know which one, the guardian, I think. Yeah, folks, we've been talking about this. If you want to transform the economy, if you want to change everything, you have, you need copper, you need nickel, you need cement, you need steel, you need, I mean, these things have to be dug up out of the ground in huge quantities. And first of all, I'm not saying they don't exist, but the investment that would be required and the fossil fuels that will be required to do it are not even being calculated yet. And now it's starting to dawn on some of these people that you just can't code up an energy transition and a couple laptops over in India. That people have to go dig stuff out of the ground. It has to be processed, smelted, refined, forged, rolled, heat treated into, you know, usable products that can, that can do what they want it to do. And this is something that's going to happen in a year or two. And now in the meantime, what do you have going on? You have resource nationalism. We're seeing as the price goes up, you know, we're seeing, you know, we've got election in Peru tomorrow between a market friendly candidate and a person that's avowing Marxist tendencies in a place that's like the third or fourth largest copper producer in the world. You have the Chilean government is going to be rewriting a new government that got elected. The previous government was thrown out that because of all the unrest and because of the COVID response and all these other things, they want to rewrite the constitution and do what? Confiscate more of the, of the economic benefit of the copper mining industry. It's the largest copper supply comes out of Chile. Are people going to invest so they can enable this transition to green energy where they need to invest, where, where the copper is, if the country is going to confiscate all the profits? No, they will not do it. So you're running into a problem here that has not been well thought out, as we've said before. People have not thought this stuff out. You know, this is what I try to tell people. <clears throat> if you're relying on the newspapers or CNN or some talking head, there's no analysis there. It all sounds good. I can go stand out in front of any Costco, Walmart. Are you for, with a clipboard, are you for green energy? Most of the people will say yes. They want to protect the environment. They don't put a lot of thought into it. What does that mean though, to do that? Do you want to transition from dirty fossil fuels? If I couch the question from dirty fossil fuels to green, clean energy. Oh, absolutely. Their little kids are there. They're rubbing their head. Oh, absolutely. I want a better future for my child. Well, you got to tell them that, you know, how much cement is in the foundation of a wind turbine or the average, you know, 2.5 megawatt wind turbine. They don't even know what you're talking about. How do you create that cement? What's the carbon footprint of that? You know, the cement and steel making industries are some of the largest carbon emitters in, in, in the world. Hello. So this is a, I thought this was a great article. I'll put a link to it. This is the opportunity though, right? Because we're betting against the premise. This energy transition, if it, it's not going to be successful in my view, but a lot of money is going to be spent. And that goes back to our theme here. Heads I win, tails I win more. Heads I win. Why? Because I, I'm going to have a, get a piece of this. We understand what's happening as they have to mine all these, you know, elements like copper, for example, being one of the main ones for this electrification push. We're going to win on that. We're already winning. And we're going to win on the fact that eventually it's going to fail and we're going to have underinvestment in fossil fuels and we're going to have big price rises there. It's already happening. It's playing out like we said. So will there be intermittent pullbacks and stuff and um, you know, deflationary scares? Yes, we talked about that earlier in this presentation. But this is how, this is my thinking on this. This is how I've thought about this for several years. And uh, it seems to be playing out. And now the realization is starting to hit people, at least thinking people that, oh, by the way, um, this requires a lot of material. Where are we going to get it? So this chart I put up here, but I can't, you can't really see it that well. Basically, you have all the countries here. This is their electricity prices uh, in kilowatt hours. Basically, 
Um, you know, you have Germany, Denmark, Portugal, Belgium, Japan, Cyprus. These are, you know, the highest cost electricity per kilowatt. You have, let's see, where's the U.S.? Uh, U.S. is down here somewhere. Uh, we got Russia down here, China. Okay, United States is right here at 15 cents a kilowatt. So basically, the more green you are, the more environmental you are, the higher. There's a cost to this. That's what the point of this is. I, I don't control policy in this country. If they want to, if you want more green, if you want more renewables, the price goes up. Proof's in the pudding. Now, I will tell you. And there will be some, you know, ankle biter comes back. If you analyze Germany's price, uh, price per kilowatt, a lot, they have very high taxes there on their energy also. Okay. But I believe, you know, but they also, if you strip out the, the taxes, they still have very high costs for the underlying product. And this is the same in a lot of these European countries where they have chosen to, um, be more green, have more renewable energy, or rebuildable energy, okay, than just focusing on nuclear or coal power. This is where a lot of these other countries, China, India, Russia, you know, they're focused, they, coal is, coal is king, gas, and nuclear. Nuclear is being built out in those countries, okay. So I think that's an interesting chart. Um, I show this all the time, but people just ignore it. They, you know, if you have it in your mind that, uh, you know, of a certain persuasion, I'm not going to dissuade you. If you want to invest money, though, you need to have this, you know, if you have high energy costs, that hamstrings, you know, it's like being in a sprint or trying to swim carrying a 10 pound weight. Uh, you might be able to do it, but you're going to have, you're going to expend a lot of energy trying to keep up with everybody else that isn't carrying more weight. I mean, that's goes without saying, doesn't it? So uh, this was also from Peter Sainsbury's website this week. I'll put a link to this. It's talking about when to sell. And it had some interesting quotes from Jim Rogers. I'll put a link to the article. There's a lot of discussion, uh, I see, in angst amongst people uh, trying to determine when they should sell. When's the appropriate time to sell? And it's one of the hardest things to do. And it's, I get a lot of questions about it myself. And I think this uh, some good, this was a really great article, which I'll put a link to, but a couple quotes here from like a famous investor like Jim Rogers. Quote, once you see headlines about the discovery of new oil reserves or wind farms popping up outside major cities, when you see mines coming online, when you discover the stockpiles of all kinds of commodities are rising, those are fundamental shifts. Then it's time to get your money out of commodities. The bull market will be over. And then it goes on to say in the um, article, the last leg of a bull run always ends in hysteria. Every investor tells themselves that they will continue to ride the bull market and be able to get out before it's too late. They are smart. There will always be a greater fool to offload their position onto. But when the market is showing signs of hysteria, fundamentals are often ignored or dismissed as unimportant. Something to worry about for another day. So you can see the we've talked about this before, you know, when you go into a position, you should be keeping a trading log, you should be keeping a log of why you invested, why you're speculating in a particular security, ETF, whatever. And then you should review that. And when it, you know, when you're up, you know, several hundred percent in something, uh, you should take that into consideration. And uh, those are above average returns. They are not that, you know, common. And when you see, uh, you know, you want to see the price of a commodity making like new all-time highs. You want to see all kinds of investment coming in, marginal producers being brought back online, euphoria in the financial markets. This is a new era. We're going to, you know, at the top of this thing, later on in this decade, everybody's going to be in commodities. Believe me, it's going to be, you know, how, how can anybody miss this? We'll be long gone. The ability to catch the majority of the move is what we're after. We're not going to get in at the exact bottom. Uh, we always buy early and I sell too soon. That's been my mantra. And my objective is to catch, catch 60 to 70% of the move, of the overall move, because you're not going to get out of the exact top. And there's different strategies to do that, about selling out as, as the thing goes parabolic or whatever. But, you know, I look for sediment, liquidity. Um, when people start creating ETFs, I mean, a perfect example was Bitcoin. You had Elon Musk, this, this is the kind of sediment 
the site, the, t- the type of things you should be looking for for short-term tops when everybody's in, when the zeitgeist is full, when the Google searches are maxed out, Elon on Saturday Night Live, Coinbase going public. Who else was left to buy these coins? Okay, so you had to, I mean, I'm not saying that's the cause, but I'm just telling you those are some of the signs you should look for. When a, uh, it's interesting, you can almost see almost a direct correlation when an industry or a sector gets very popular, you'll see an ETF be created. Why? Because it's a maximum amount of investor interest in what's the goal of all these companies. Not to make you money is to get assets under management and cream fees off. And so they're not going, you'll see the same thing on the, on the downside. Once a clue to buy an industry is when the ETFs get taken out. You, there's no more coal ETF. There's no more shipping ETFs. They got rid of them because there was no inter, investor interest. There was no assets being attracted to those sectors. Therefore, there was no, the ability, the, the, the maintenance of those ETFs exceeded uh, the fees that they were able to garner for the assets they were able to attract. I mean, these are the kind of things that I look for. I mean, they're not, they're not tangible, but they're intangibles. They're things that, I, that, that clue me in to what's going on, on sediment, on um, you know, liquidity, Google searches, you know, how many for certain terms. You know, uh, when something's like blasted out uh, to 100% on, or 100 on, on the Google search index, you know, everybody's looking at it. Well, who else is left to buy? Same thing on the bottom. If it's blown out, who's left to sell? Everybody sold. So these are the extremes that I look for. Those aren't the only things that I use, but those, that's a perfect example. All right, that's it for this week, guys. Um, I know this was a little bit political. I get aggravated because critical thinking is important for all facets of your life. This is mostly talking about investments on this channel, but you know, medically, um, politically, all these things, you have to be a critical thinker and you have to understand that what motivates human beings. Um, money motivates them, power, uh, fame, and people will do, certain people will do anything for these things. They will lie, they will cheat, they will deceive you, and uh, you need to check everybody. You need to, uh, you know, trust but verify, as the Russians used to say. You know, that's attributed to Reagan, it was actually the Russians that said that about us. So, that's a, that's a good thing. Be, be skeptical. In this time and age, we've had so many, we've lost so much trust in all of our institutions, educational establishment, the political process. And we have 50% of the people in this country think that, you know, the election was stolen. Um, goes on, I can go on and on for hours about all of the things that people have been deceived about or the tr- tr- truth wasn't told about, Okay. And then long story short, many years later, when stuff gets declassified, we find out that, you know, oh, it really wasn't the way we were told it was. And so it's very important when you're dealing with your money and your health and these important matters, you know, it doesn't really matter about some things, but some of these things do matter. And they are creating a, you know, security state that's trying to keep you from, even if you are curious to try to find these things. So it takes some work. The information's out there. Alternative media, I'm part of it. Um, I'm just a commentator, though. I'm not, you know, there's people out there doing tons of research. They know what they're talking about. And you have to go out and find this stuff. And you have to make your own decisions. And guess what? You have to live with the decisions you make. If you want to, you know, I was watching uh, Magnum Force the other day with Dirty Harry. And his partner, they rolled up on some gangsters. And he was trying to, uh, Dirty Harry was trying to get them aggravated. And the uh, partner was like, get sheepish. Because he's pulled the car up next to him and asked him where San Quentin was and then sped away. And his partner was like, you always have to do things your way. And then Dirty Harry responded, well, if you do something somebody else's way, you take your life into your own hands. I don't do things. I don't put my life in other people's hands. Okay. I've never done that was in the military. I didn't do it in industry. I never got a scratch on me. Okay. And I'm not going to start now at 54 years old. I'm going to be skeptical. I'm going to look at what motive, what the motivation is behind what people are telling me and what they're trying to do. Okay. Qui bono. Okay. Who benefits? Follow the money trail. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Appreciate the support and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks.